well. We'll celebrate both Arbor Day and Earth Day. Uh, we'll do a, uh, a spring cleanup, if you will, of the Gardner Greenway, uh, celebrating Earth Day. And then uh, we'll have a picnic in uh, Winwood Park. And uh, at that time, uh, one of our staff members will do a tree planting uh, demonstration everyone uh, if you can attend to attend it's a fun time I know Chris and his crew are there uh, every year uh, something I've been going to for a long time uh, and uh, it's a fun uh, fun afternoon it's fun to watch the uh, kids get excited and muddy as they uh, go about cleaning up the greenway from the winter's uh, debris so it's a Good event, good event. So and, uh, there's always hot dogs and chips and you know, a can of pop. So everyone welcome on the 28th. Very good. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, sir. Uh, we do have another proclamation. This for National Crime Victims Rights Weeks. Uh, this is a uh, something that I think is very important, something that obviously is in the news uh, on a regular basis, but uh, you know, we hear about the, the crime and then we, we you know, have the initial uh, concern for the victims, but then as time goes on that, that seems to fade and is replaced by uh, other news and, and we forget about these things, so I think it is important we remember. So whereas 18.7 million Americans are directly harmed by crime each year, and each crime affects many more family members, friends, neighbors, and co-workers, and whereas the physical, emotional, and financial impact of crime falls on people of all ages and abilities, and of all economic, racial, and social backgrounds, and whereas today thousands of victims' assistance programs provide help and support to child victims of violence and sexual abuse, stalking victims, survivors of homicide, victims, victims of drunk driving crashes, and victims of domestic dating and sexual violence and other crimes. And whereas the city of Gardner, Kansas is joining forces with victim service programs, criminal justice officials, and concerned citizens throughout the state of Kansas and the United States of America to raise awareness of victims' rights and observe National Victims Crime Week. National, victim, National Crime Victims' Rights Week, excuse me. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, David C. Nevada, Mayor of the City of Gardner, Kansas, do hereby proclaim the week of April 22nd to 28, 2012, as National Crime Victims' Rights Week, and to affirm the City of Gardner's commitment to respect and enforce victims' rights and address their needs and express our appreciation for those victims and crime survivors who have turned personal tragedy into a motivating force to improve our response to victims of crime and build a more just that is a, uh, if something is a tragedy, we hope that we all avoid, uh, but we certainly can empathize with those uh, who have been victimized by crime. We do have time, a lot of it on the agenda, for anyone who wishes to speak on an item that does not appear on the agenda. Or an item that is on the agenda and not part of the public hearing. So that being the case, we will move on to the consent agenda. Is there a council member who wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda? Number four, please. How would the council like to proceed with items one through three? We would approve items one through three. Second. Motion Harris and second Morrow. Can we approve consent items one through three? All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 
Consent item number four, consider authorizing the purchase of three police cars from Landmark Dodge. How many uh, miles are on these cars? Well, I, um, the unit number 899, which is 1997, has got 107,249. Uh, unit 926, at the time this was written, had um, 91,650. And uh, unit 927, at the time this was written, was 92,010 miles. No, under the under the normal maintenance, you know, or the uh, vehicle maintenance replacement, we go three years or 100,000 miles is what we do on police cars. Uh, primarily because, unlike other vehicles for the city, these are run 24 hours a day, and um, they're not. We're used for eight hours and go back. They we replace them so we don't get into that uh, expensive maintenance and, and stuff on them as they go on. But we haven't had any problems with somebody getting in a car and not running or anything. No, none of these. Any others? No. no, usually we try to keep ours to work and when somebody calls we can get there. Um, the uh, acquaintance, I guess I should say, uh, works as a police officer in Leewood, so they, they don't even look at changing their cars until 110,000 miles. And here we have two cars that aren't even at the 100,000 number, how do you, how do you? Change? That's the replacement schedule that the city has set up for us. I mean, that's what it, it's been for, I don't know how many ages, or how long it's been that way, but it's that's how we usually calculate when we replace our vehicles. Has, has anyone done any studies since then, since this was put into effect to see if cars are lasting longer? And no. Most likely? Council member, think that would be how, how many um, extra cars do you have per shift? As far as we mean, that are in use. do you have any? If, if something breaks down, are there any that are in use? We usually, well, I, I don't know, the, I don't have the exact number of cars I have right now, but with four to five cars in the street, I have maybe one or two extra that if one breaks down, we can get somebody back in service. I mean, it's not like we have a whole parking lot sitting there full of cars. It was uh, in the council action form that uh, uh, the budget included the replacement of four patrol units. Mm -hmm. However, there is only a need to replace three currently. Correct. Uh, the, the one that doesn't need to be replaced, is it similar in age or, or was the mileage just... Mileage wasn't close? even close to these. That's why. I mean, these were up getting to where by the time we get these things ordered, <clears throat> excuse me, five to six months to get them in, um, sometimes they're going to be up to 100,000 miles plus. I mean, that's why the, right now they're not at that mileage, but by the time the new cars come in, chances are they're going to be right at the 100,000 mile, excuse me, 100,000 mile mark. But we didn't have a fourth car that was close to going to be that mileage, so we didn't ask for it. Um, and to Councilman Potovich's uh, question. I, how long has the, uh, the current replacement policy been in place? I don't know. Three days. But we look at them every year. As um, Jim noted, we're not replacing one of them because it didn't need to be up. But at the time we did the budget last year, we estimated that it would. So we are looking at them as they come up for replacement and considering mileage and wear and tear. Um, and these are different than the rest of our fleet. We definitely look at our other fleet um, with a much more long <coughs> replacement schedule. We do this this way so that we don't end up with all of the vehicles and replacement in one year. We try to keep them spread out so the budget stays somewhat consistent. Otherwise, what's happening in a lot of our other areas is because we've deferred maintenance and we're getting to the point that the useful life is far beyond gone is that we're starting to stack up capital outlay on, on vehicles because we've shoved and shoved and shoved. And so really deviating from this and um, is not going to necessarily help us because that means next year, instead of the two that we currently have in 13, we could have four or five that we need to replace. So. Unless you lengthen the entire cycle. 
That's assuming they're still functioning well. And I mean, they're your emergency response vehicles. I understand it's an insurance policy, but you can't insure against every risk. And uh, we've never had one fail. Uh, how do we know we're even taking them close to the, the point at which they will? I mean, we can be we never them. said we didn't have one fail. I'm sorry. We never said we didn't have one you fail. Never had one fail, and uh, you know when you needed it in the. On these the, ones that he's referring to, but we've had others fail. And what what circumstances? I mean, just patrolling the area, going out on a high high uh, speed pursuit. Well, we've had engines blow. We've had transmissions blow. I mean, cars are cars. They're going to break, and it doesn't take a high speed pursuit to do that. I mean, we've had cars that we've purchased, brand new cars that have been to the shop under warranty. But there were limits. I mean, they just, they, we got a bad car. And unfortunately, when that, you know, warranty wore out, we, you know, continued putting money into it until it was time to replace it. So that's why we got on this retention schedule and got to where we just cycled them out. But yeah, we've had cars fail. And it's not just about failure. It's about diminishing returns on when you do have something at that mileage, you're going to have a higher likelihood of a major replacement of something and then the expense is more than the cost of replacing the fleet in a regular pattern. So what are these cars worth then? Well, well the council well, action form there. No, I mean the ones that you're, you're getting rid of. What, what will you get for them? It says right there. Is it right, right there on the council action form? Oh, oh, sorry. Just right. um, on the 899 car, what kept it in the fleet through 170,000 miles? That was an unmarked car okay. that we used for some undercover work and then used that for uh, officers going to school as opposed to paying them mileage going back and forth to some of the schools. Through uh, the budget that was reviewed and passed last summer by the council, is, were these numbers part of that budget or was there a budget established and these came in and comparably no, So these exact numbers off of the yes. marked bid were part of the budget process? Those were part of the budget, yes. Okay. What would you do with the money if you had it to use somewhere else and didn't buy cars with it? I don't know. You're asking me a question right off the top of the head here that, you know, that's something that... I mean, you, you, know, you have other needs, I would assume, than, than this. I'm not going to say, I, you know, with all due respect, I'm not going to sit and speculate what I'm going to do with that kind of money right now. My responsibility, what I'd like to see is these vehicles replaced so that I make sure the officers have good equipment that I know is going to get them to call when somebody calls for help. As a council, we wanted to look at the retention policy and <clears throat> do a comparison and say, when would that time be? Would that be during the upcoming budget process to see how we would compare next to Leewood to Olathe and Nobleman Park so next year we have these questions answered rather than on the floor to make sure our policy is in check with other communities and we're not ahead of the game? I can tell you off the top of my head that our policy is in check with most other communities, especially on emergency vehicles. 100,000 is almost the outside limit. Um, certainly on ambulances that I'm most familiar with, when they got to that point, we either replaced the chassis or the entire vehicle. It's just, it's a matter of economics that when you get to that age and you have to start replacing major components, the cost of that adds up to be more than the adequate replacement of the fleet in a timely fashion. It's just more cost effective, it's more reliable, you cannot have a failure on an emergency call. You cannot. That's just the way it is. How would council like to proceed? I move that we authorize the purchase of three 2012 Dodge Charger six-cylinder police units from Landmark Dodge at a cost of 56968 in applicable fees, plus additional expenditures for painting, striping, and equipment replacement as noted. Second. Motion brought to move second Harrison <coughs> that we authorize purchase of three 2012 Dodge Charger six-cylinder police units from Landmark Dodge at a cost of 56 968 speed and additional expenditures. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. Motion carries. New business item number one, consider authorizing the interim city administrator to execute a contract with Dale Brothers for the demolition of the old Navy and city water treatment plants. There are two uh, treatment plants down below the Gardner Lake Dam. Uh, one is called the City Plant. It's uh, been out of service uh, since the late 1990s. 
the second one is called the Navy plant, which was built as part of the Naval Air Station project. Uh, we stopped using it in 2005 because we were unable to uh, meet current standards for a treatment. Both are secured, uh, they're boarded, they're within a fenced area, however they do constitute an attractive nuisance in an area that's somewhat isolated. We have 90000 budgeted in this year's uh, budget for the demolition of both buildings. Uh, we advertised a bid in the Gardner News and on the city website, received six bids on uh, April 3rd. The low bid was submitted by Dale Brothers in the amount of $58,600. Dale Brothers has worked for other area municipalities. Uh, they're able to check with uh, one of the references was Overland Park. Uh, they did give them a good reference for building demolition. Uh, we would recommend a word to Dale Brothers. It was, um, over, I guess it's been seven years now since those plants have been non functioning. Has there been incidents, safety incidents, police reports that have occurred out there as that's pushed this place? Or are we in a position, I mean, I know you don't like to keep putting it off, but if there's no incidents and there's no true safety measures and it's really preventative, then maybe these expenses are a better place somewhere else. Recall, I do not, I can't recall if we've had any Yes, we have. <laughs> yes, the reason that it got, they all got buttoned down so much is we had people breaking in looking for chemicals. Those chemicals at the time could have been used to make meth, and Captain Moore might know a little bit about this. But if someone were to fall in one of the pits, which are not covered or secure and get hurt out there, we do have a pretty big liability on our hands because the likelihood someone would see or hear what's happening. Um, this is the first time we've been able to get it in the budget. Um, and I would certainly, it's a one-time expense. It's not an ongoing or recurring expense. I would certainly look at getting rid of this risk issue that you have out there and, and getting it off the books once and for all. So. Captain Moore, from your perspective, is the fencing and the signage out there adequate, I mean, to make folks know abundantly clear that they aren't welcome on the property and they should stay away for their own safety? Well, you can say it's abundantly clear, but it's only as good as what it is. I mean, you can come over the fence, like in that, what they did last time, uh, last couple of times I remember going out there, hearing of the reports, they just went over the fence. And if they want to get in, they're going to get in. I mean, you know, short of putting electric fence and, you know, razor wire on it, I don't, I don't know how you're going to keep them out, but, yeah, they just went over the fence, they went in the building, and as Melissa said, you know, unfortunately there's people that are after chemicals and everything else nowadays, and it, to me it was a, it was a hazard. Is that property backs right up to the park, though, right? Yes. I did have a question regarding the demolition, uh, did they inspect and, and does this include any asbestos mitigation, any of those types of... We, ins we inspected it, did not see anything that was probable asbestos, however, as part of the contract, the contractor will be required to do an asbestos inspection prior to demolition. Should we encounter it, then we'll have to uh, make adjustments at that point. But uh, based on our inspection, there really isn't any structures that are probable asbestos the duct work, uh, the insulation, is, there's no insulation that would be, lead itself to its business. And then the other question I had that uh, since the Navy plant was a uh, WPA project, is there any historical significance to anything out there? Flax or anything that we want to retain? Nothing left of it. It's not. I, I personally had thought about uh, is there any use of it, but it's just it's basically just too far gone. And once again, with the uh, uh, clarifiers in the open pits, it's just uh, needs to go. Okay, how would uh, council like to proceed? I move we authorize the interim city administrator to execute a contract with Delbert. <coughs> Second. Motion Harris and second Morrow that we authorize the interim city administrator to execute a contract for demolition of the Navy and city water treatment plants. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries.
New business item number two, consider authorizing the interim city administrator to an agreement with Medical Lodge's Gardner for the installation of a sanitary sewer line grinder at the small Bolt Creek lift station. David. There are two, plant, two lift stations at the Bull Creek site. One's the large one that went online in 2008. There's a smaller lift station that predates the other lift station. It picks up a very small drainage area west of the plant or former plant site. Uh, we're unable to uh, abandon this and take it directly into the large lift station because of the depth of the, of the line entering it. So the main, uh, roughly half the flow is, comes from the medical lodges. When it was built, they were required to put in a bar screen to uh, catch large objects coming down their sewer line. Uh, it's, been, it's been a maintenance problem. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been effective, and the uh, medical lodges folks haven't been very diligent or have had difficulties in maintaining it. Therefore, we've had numerous blockages at the Smith Station. Uh, on average, we're looking at about twice a month. We'll have to go out. If we're lucky, we reverse the pumps the towel or whatever's caught will reverse and eventually uh, flow out. Sometimes we have to pull the pumps. Uh, it's been ongoing discussion with the uh, management of medical lodges since I've been here. Um, this last summer, I started talking to them and they said, look, how about uh, participating in the cost of a grinder? That way the whole issue is taken care of. We eliminate our maintenance problem. You eliminate your maintenance problem. Uh, we were able to demonstrate to them that the uh, materials were coming from medical lodges, uh, convinced them that they're the only uh, customer on the line that would be discharging this type of materials, agreed to pay 48% of the cost, which was based on the flow coming from medical lodges versus the entire area to the lift station. The estimated cost of the work is around $16,200. Uh, it's based on uh, roughly $12,000 for a grinder pump about $4,000 for a manhole structure uh, to put the pump in. Uh, as we've gone through it, uh, we're able to actually look at a, a point farther upstream from the uh, lift station, closer to the park site, better access, plus it's near a transformer that could provide power to this device uh, be installed by city staff. Approved, <coughs> the medical lodges would contribute 48% up to a maximum of 7680 for the projects. Uh, the city would proceed with procurement and installation of the uh, uh, grinder. I'm happy to answer any questions. Dave, if we've uh, deemed that they're 100% solely responsible for it, why are they only paying 48%? Because there are others, the chance of other material coming down the line, uh, you know, they could continue to try and maintain their bar screen. All of our major plants have grinders. It's in our interest to go ahead and install a grinder to protect this lift station. So based on the uh, drainage area and the ratio of flow, we feel this is a, a reasonable reasonable arrangement, plus it does help us from a maintenance angle. But if they weren't in the line, we wouldn't have to install it. If they weren't in the line, we wouldn't have as many maintenance problems. Huh. But it would still be advisable to have a grinder pump. How many times have you, made, have you done maintenance on it uh, in the last, you know, since 2009? I think... Uh, that, that weren't related to medical lodges. Well, we, we do routine maintenance, but as far as blockages, Emergency. it's been about every every two weeks. Right, but that's, that was due to... Their, that was due to their, their sewage, right? Right. So, I mean, how many times beyond that? 60 times well, in three we, years. Well, we have a routine maintenance schedule that we follow, but this would be above and beyond. Why don't we require them to put the right screen in so we can test and see whether we needed a grinder pump at all? The, anyway. We have done that. We have worked on that for the last decade. Uh, once again, it's on private property. It requires us to inspect it regularly. Uh, as I said, we've gone out. Sometimes we'd find the screen either missing or you know, chained where it was functional. So it's a case of do we want to put in a device to take care of it or play policeman and constantly be checking in this manual? Is there a legal action we can take to keep them, to make them do the right thing, Jim? Well, it, it, 
we have to provide them with sewer service because we've given them a hookup and it's very difficult to identify in all cases that the material that's blocking it is coming from medical lodges. Uh, I know I talked to Jim when we tried to work this agreement out and uh, if you could really identify 100% of the problem, you know, at medical lodges, we could probably put more pressure on them to do something. Uh, but my understanding is that it's, it's not easy for us to pinpoint the entire problem at medical lodges. And medical lodges have been here for many, many, many years, so. Is that that would it? That'd be really difficult. I yeah. think, it, uh, yes, it would be. I mean, you know, granted, we can come up and say this towel came from you, but, you know, there's always a case where what about something else? Jim? Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Where else, what other businesses have the, uh, you know, the size to flush or, or get rid of a towel? I mean, it can't be the residents, right? Well, I mean, I would think it would stop up farther up the line than. You, you, one would think. You know, I, I you know, they, they, all sorts of stuff. You know, the folks will flush clothing articles and uh, towels have made their way down, and the antiseptic wipes will make their way down the line. Uh, I don't see anything in the council action form that talks about this being a, a 2012 budget item. Is this uh, uh, an item that was meant? that was included in the 2012 budget? No, this is something we would, basically the ARC share would be about $8,000. It's the kind of maintenance type thing we can absorb. It's the kind of thing our budget, though it may not specifically identify, uh, we can we absorb and we do what, on a maintenance basis. We allocate dollars for maintenance. With the eliminate, with the elimination of uh, most of the breakdown maintenance, how long would it take for the manpower cost to pay for the, the this installation of the grinder. So I'm gonna have to defer to Jim. Don't have an exact figure, but it, it wouldn't take very long. It, it wouldn't be more than a few years. And the, the, the life on on one of these grinders might be uh, at least 10 years, and uh, it could be as long as 20. It depends on the particular grinder and and you know, what maintenance you do on the grinder. Case in point, we have a large, much larger, more durable type grinder up at the Kill Creek plant. We had to replace it about two years ago only because a piece of uh, PVC pipe came down the line and it basically jammed and locked it up. I mean, these things you know, they grind up wood, clothing, I and mean, they're very vigorous. And that thing runs 24 7. The, uh is the need the result of the changeover from a plant to a pump? In other words, when we went from the plant to the lift station, when it was a plant, we were able to catch the, the debris <coughs> in the treatment process? Uh, no, this, uh, this has always been a bottleneck. The large lift station we have has a grinder uh, upstream of it, so everything that comes through that path goes through the grinder. This actually is pumped up ahead of the grinder, so anything that gets through this particular pump uh, will go through the grinder before it hits the uh, the pumps on the large lift station. It's just that some of the larger material will jam these pumps. Jim, I have a question for you. Um, if the city were to say, or the council were to say here and say, we really don't think we should be on the hook for 52% of this and we're prepared to, you know, fight for that. And, and they're like, okay, let's go, let's line our folks up against one another. What do you think the odds are the cost to actually take that to task in the court system would go past our 8,200? I know you can't really say yes or no, but do you think there's an odds of it reaching that number pretty quickly, that $8,200 to? Well, number one, you can't shut them off not a facility like medical. Right, but so I mean, the only option would be to file some type of civil action right. if they wouldn't cooperate. You you just can't get into court less than about $5,000 okay. just to get pleadings on file, respond to their pleadings. And you just, the problem with litigation is it's like a train going down the track. You, you're not in total control of it. Once it starts down the track, you don't know how far they're going to fight it and you could end up spending 
$25,000 by no way. So the $8,500 yeah. 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 The other question I had is if we can remove the provision the way it's listed here where they are up to a maximum of $7,680 for the 48% because in my view, it's 48% of whatever the total ends up being. If this goes overrun and it ends up costing us $18,300, the city's on the hook for a bigger percentage under the wording here. Can we remove that wording where their responsibility is the 48% regardless of what the total ends up being? I'd say if that's the council's interest, what I'd ask you to do is continue this until the next meeting. We go back to medical lodge and report back to you. Do you have any idea how, how we arrived at the, the 7680 number? I, you know, if you look at it on the on the page without just, explanation, it, it seems. Well, unfair. it was just a, you know, it's, it's, it's just a based on the percentage of the calculated flow of what they're generating versus what the entire service area going to the pump is. So it's a an engineering calculation based on the uh, flow potential. Fifty-two percent of the flow comes from other areas, and forty-eight percent. Right. Yeah. How many other grinder or grinders are there in the city? Uh, all our major lift stations have them. Uh, East lift station has one. South lift station has one. North lift station has one. Uh, the Bull Creek lift station has one. But those are the large ones. Yes. And this one is not a large. It would be best to have them on all lift stations. However, this is the one that has the most problems. Most of the ones are just simple residential areas. You're just not getting the floor. You know, the thing is, I mean, the council action form says that it's, uh, I mean, basically 60 times in the last three years that, well, actually until 2011, so two and a half years, due to plugging from towels and fibrous material discharge from medical lodges. I mean, that's, I don't see anywhere else where anyone else I mean, you can find any indication that uh, anyone else is responsible for it, especially if you know that the screen is not the correct screen for it. I mean, I, how much does a screen cost? I mean, we could just offer to buy them a screen and, and install it. For, well, that, that's an option. What, what, what or else just we can go back and say, look, the uh, council's chosen not to do this, and uh, we want you to install a screen. We'll be watching you on a daily basis. I think we should do that. Do we have 24 access, hour access to check on that, or what if a blockage happens? How long? Well, I don't have the staff blockage? to be chasing these people. Well, absolutely, sure. And uh, you know, yeah, I guess we could walk up there. I mean, I've actually been there and looked at them mm -hmm. years ago. I mean, yeah, but I certainly wouldn't recommend that we waste our staff time looking at their bar screen every day. Does the installation of this grinder provide us any other benefit? So, <coughs> that medical lodge aside, having a grinder at this particular site, is there any other be benefits long term on the maintenance of the other equipment? There is the grind well that's why we install them at the major list stations. Uh, in fact, we have a lot of these smaller ones around. I mean if you could have if it was affordable it'd be good insurance policy at every list station. However a lot of ours are just a very small quote unquote temporary list station so they were not installed. Uh, but yeah if you have a permanent installation of which this one is not going to go away it's good business. One last question I had. Do we have a mechanism in place? I mean, I know we could go back retroactively, but there's a blockage. We go down there, find out it's all medical lodges stuff that's creating the blockage. Do we have a system that we can invoice them for the time and the downtime to recover any of the costs associated with that? Whether or not we've billed them thus far, but going forward, if we say replace your grate right now, and if a blockage comes up, it's full of your towels, there's going to be an invoice cost due to the blockage of that and the downtime that we experienced and the extra man hours I had to go into fixing that. So that's a possibility. All due respect, I think that's really what we've done here. I mean, to find a customer that's willing to pay up to half because they realize that they're probably a significant portion of this problem, I think is a great deal. Uh, we have to, as Mr. Hubbard said, we have to provide the service. Uh, the realization that if we get some debris and it happens to be a gym sock from somebody else, they have evidence that it's not entirely them. This is a small amount of money that we are ended up having to pay with consideration of all the other things that we spend money on. And, and every dollar is important. I'm not discounting that. But the realization that we have a customer that's willing to pay up to half to make this situation right so we don't have further problems, further man hours dealing with a plugged sewer, 
seems to me a pretty good deal. You know, at times, though, that I understand that the dollar part of it is small when we compare it even to the other things that are today's agenda, but I, I don't know that I'm the only one here that says we're, we're paying 52% for 90% of their problem. I understand maybe 10% trickles from somewhere else. So, you know, if you say they're willing to pay 50%, I think they're getting a great deal by only having to. Um, now, still, if it's going to cost us too much money to chase it down the road, then that's the only thing to measure. And if the downtime costs us more than that over three years, then that's something to measure else. So it might equal itself out. But principal alone, we're paying to fix their problem is the way I see it. But sometimes that's the way that you have to move forward to make sure it's the most efficient way for everyone to move along. But that's the problems I've had and why I've got a list of you know, 15 questions on an $8,000 budget. You know, the other thing that I, I just might add to this is that this is an ongoing problem, 2009, 2010 through 2011. We were talking to the Medical Lodge people in July of 2011. Um, I, I guess I would have, uh, not knowing whether or not we were going to be able to get to them to agree to uh, pay for any of the replacement costs, I mean, the, the purchase and installation costs. Uh, you know, and I think that this is probably something that should have been, instead of included in maintenance, included as a, a line item on the, the 2012 budget. Actually, that's always 2020, right? Yeah. Yes, I, 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 hey, I understand. Uh, you know, and, and yeah, now I've got my, my from the from the standpoint of the discussion. Uh, you know, we talked about policy issues earlier on the last item. Is this something that uh, council wants to pursue from the standpoint of policy that says if then and we do it, submit them a submit an invoice and then fight the collection. It, you know, I don't know what we can do for existing for existing customers. What we do when we bring on new uh, new clients. I mean, when you think about this, and think about the application, and think about what's uh, you know, potential future. The the likelihood of growth in nursing and retirement homes <coughs> is high. Um, and if that's you know, if that's the factor, if it's you know, if it's related to either staff or, or residents, you know, just tossing because it's an easy thing to do. You know, is that a is that a policy requirement that that type of facility must have a grinder installed if one is not there? So I don't know. That, yeah. You know, I mean that. I think there's merit to what you're suggesting there, uh, but you know these are these are people that have been here for yeah, a nice long while. Been, yeah. uh, aside from this, best I can tell, good corporate citizens, uh, and and yeah, I you know, I, guess I suppose we could table it and 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 bring it back saying, hey, you, you need to pay 48 percent even if it goes over. But but, but by the time we add in staff time to do to do that, are we really was, seeing any kind of problems out of yeah, that? Which was the point I was so, getting to. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, it's, I, I think there's another point to be made here, and I think it's about precedent. This is not going to be the only place this happens in the sewer system. And if we have a precedent that we have a customer who is perceived to be, if not provable, but very likely the major contributor to the problem, we can go to other customers and ask them to do the same thing. Now we may not get the same kind of response because there's going to be large customers that have plenty of lawyers that are going to say, try, try to recover from it. The fact that we've established a precedent that we've gotten a customer voluntarily to pay up to almost half of a problem that they likely are, are mostly responsible for, I think that's a good precedent for the community. That says we can go after, at least ask, large companies who perhaps are likely cloggers of the system. And it could be Greece, too. I mean, there's, there's situations at uh, New Century when I remember building a package plant out there. Same kind of thing. We knew where most of it was coming from. 
the county paid the entire cost of that plant because we provide sewer service. That's the business they're in. We wanted the business out there. They came and we processed their sewage even though it's a higher cost per company, if you will, than, than the normal flow from a normal business that doesn't process <coughs> foods and grease and things of that nature. So I think it's a good precedent for the city that says we have on, on record a, a company that's willing to pay for part of the problem that they have likely created. Dave, how big is the screen we're talking about? And how big is the pipe? So you yeah, have standard discharge pipe. We're talking coming out of there. It's about this, you know, six inch pipe. Whatever the standard six inch is. screen. And the screen itself is in a uh, is in a manhole type structure. That's uh, screens probably yay by yay, put on a slope. You know, they have to come out and periodically clean it. And sometimes it stuff gets through. And sometimes it doesn't. So it's not a, it's not a huge screen. No. It's just, it's in effect, it is, the system has been ineffective over the last decade. And granted, you know, folks have been, my staff's been talking to these people over the last decade. And this has been something that's been talked about since I got here. You know, I was at a chamber function at medical lodges last, I don't remember if it was last summer or last fall, but I mean, at that point, I was talking with the director there. I think he was making noise about not wanting to pay anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, was that the case? Or yes. Yeah, so it wasn't. We got, we got them to. Yeah. You no, know, it was basically, it was, they were saying, well, are you sure it's not Meadowbrook? And they said, well, Meadowbrook doesn't go through this line. Right. So you're, not, it's you're, you're the one going through the line, and here it is. And, it, and, and, and Jim was saying, we're going to recoup this cost. And, two or three years just off of not having the service that in the life of the equipment is going to be 10 to 20 years. It's not our cost though, that's the problem. It says right here, well, 50 in, times in the last two and a half years. In, in which case, I think that the, the time that we spent out there is our cost. It shouldn't be, they, they should be held accountable. I mean, we cannot bill customers once we charge them their hookup fee and their monthly rates or whatever they pay. That's what they pay for the system, including maintenance. Why don't we put a screen in right before the uh, the lift station? Well, then it's basically yeah, then we screen. Okay. Yeah, I mean we've had lift I mean, stations the screen starts, baskets. If the screen backs up, then we'll know exactly who's who's yeah. producing the sewage that's backing it up. Won't we? You don't want to go there. We've had basket catchers on other lift stations, and you don't want to do it. Why not? Well, I mean all I have to do is just just think about. It. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean that's the, the, the visuals, notwithstanding the, you know, I mean, anytime you deal with this, there's, there's risk to personnel from infection and, and uh, everything else. I mean, I, you know, I look at it from the standpoint of we're in the business of producing, of processing sewer, and, uh, and uh, it's more than others. The uh, you know the cost of improvement to the system and the cost of bettering the system is generally on the shoulders of the provider, and then the <coughs> those costs uh, are either taken to the bottom line as as efficiencies or savings, or you know as part of doing business and assessed as part of the, the general fee. I mean that's just what you do when you're in business. It's, um, you know, I, I mean, that's... Well, I, I, I think that I'm okay with moving forward with this. I'm okay with moving forward this, with this tonight. I would say that the mayor's suggestion about a policy regarding, uh, you know, installation of a, a grinder if one is not currently in place or <laughs> Facilities that are likely to, to provide waste that's going to clog screens, uh, that that should be something that we look at going forward. But yeah, I'm billing people and trying to recoup it and spending costs on attorneys, and, and uh, uh, you know, it adds up a lot quicker than the, the $8,000 that we're going to spend on on this improvement. I 
move we authorize the interim city administrator to execute an agreement with Medical Lodge Gardner for the installation of a sanitary sewer line grinder at the small Bolt Creek lift station for the agreement with Medical Lodge. Second. Motion, Broxton, and second, Harrison, that we authorize the interim city administrator to execute an agreement with Medical Lodge Gardner for the installation of a sanitary sewer line grinder. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. Motion carries. Uh, next item on the agenda is council updates. Uh, you should have before you a uh, budget schedule. Right. This is just an FYI. This is the um, dates we are looking at for um, betting the 2013 budget. Um, we will come to you um, with a kind of preliminary discussion of the three major funds, which is water, wastewater, and the general fund um, at the May 14th work session. We did that last year and it's kind of give you a background on how we're going to be <coughs> forecasting our revenues so that you understand sort of what the basis of the budget is built on um, before we actually start diving into the, the meat and potatoes of it in June. So um, please look at these dates. If there's any major conflicts um, with your personal schedules with these, let um, Laura know. I guess at this point I'm starting to try and pull back out of stuff. Let Laura know and um, we can make some adjustments if we need to. We do have a publication date that we have to be mindful of and that um, is noted as July 23rd. So um, that's uh, where we start running into some trouble with um, making sure that we have proper notice to the public for the budget to get to the county on time. So thoughts or comments? Um, I know you haven't had a chance to look at it, but if you do, just go ahead and get a hold of Laura or, well, or Mike. Whoever wants to, wants to take your email, we should be able to work through this um, and note it's not a big deal. So, um, But uh, it's the same standard lineup that we did last year and um, giving time for discussion um, as needed. So, When, uh, it, apparently the first uh, conversations we'll be having in, in session will be June 11. When does the big door stop? Well, when are we <laughs> going to get that delivered? That you won't receive until probably the week before. So I'm speaking on something that I won't be working on. So. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but I'm going to help get the budget finished internally and we're going to start staff reviews of the budget next week and then the push to put the document together will start henceforth thereafter. But as far as timing is concerned, hopefully in May, um, mid to late May. But we have to button down our hatches internally first and we're not even started. So as far as upper Start level upper review. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I know last year, uh, well, and I know we have projected budgets for for future years. Are we, do we have any idea whether or not we're anticipating a, a shortfall? Or we don't have any of the summary information rolled up. We know how we finished out 2011. And um, we have, and we are going to have our estimates for 12, but we aren't anywhere near talking about 13 to 18, and we will talk about those as part of the process. But internally, um, the departments have been working on their budgets, but uh, Laura and I haven't looked at any of their 13 or 12 estimate 13 forward yet. So until next, next week. So we don't start our internal processes till then. anything else? Council, questions for staff? I have one question. Um, what will be the hiring process uh, for Melissa's position? Is that something that we're going to wait for the new administrator to be a part of? And, and uh, just an update where we are in that process to start getting a timeline in place and thought process rolling on that. <coughs> okay. Um, with respect to uh, the assistance position, uh, you know, I think that's something that we as a, as a council should talk about. 
uh, from the standpoint of how we want to approach it. I mean, right now it is uh, assistant city administrator and community development. Uh, whenever there is a changeover with a significant position, I think it's wise to step back, uh, take a look at it, and uh, think about realignment if that's, if that's required. Uh, you know, I think the first order of business we can lead to is the city administrator. Um, we are at a point where we're ready, committee's ready to um, interview finalists and um, and go from there. Uh, you know, I guess this is a good opportunity to, to, to ask, you know, from your perspective as the council as a whole, um, you know, if the committee has a clear candidate, uh, do you want the committee to bring that forward or do you want to bring back the finalists and have everybody review all the finalists? Question. I think there should be a review before a single finalist in place, at least of what the qualifications are that led to that decision. Even if it's bringing down the finalist to a final three, I don't know how many finalists you've identified, but bringing it just to one might, uh, some folks might say that might cut the process out a little bit too deep and maybe not give you the exposure and maybe the, the clarity that some would like. Okay. Final three. All right. So you haven't interviewed anyone yet? But yeah. oh. So I we will have. have uh, I guess I'm not, I don't understand. What are the options that you're giving us? Well, if, if the committee, uh, you know, does, we're going to be face to face at the <coughs> committee, and if the committee identifies, uh, you know, a clear candidate, the question was, do we, do we just want us to bring that candidate forward, uh, and uh, or, you know, re interview all the, the, the yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, the process may. yield that clear thing. That's fine. I mean, if you want to bring them, bring them back in, that's okay with me. That was just a question. It expedites the process a little. I'm okay as well. Yes. Yeah. I think you're okay with what? Bringing more than one forward. Or bringing one forward. But my, my opinion is, is that Consensus of council. If, if if they want to see more than one, that's great. If they want to see just one, I'm confident with the way that the uh, process is progressing. I mean, of course, we'd like to see more than one. I mean, what would be the point of interviewing one candidate? I mean, what what would we do? How, how did you make a good choice when you're presented with one person and say, "Is this"? It's okay. Well, it depends on how you look at the choice. I mean, you know, the committee's been charged with going through the, the screening and interview process, and, and if the committee's done that and you know, brought forth a recommendation, I mean, again, if we, I guess I'll uh, go over it once more. The process is that the mayor uh, brings forth the candidates for approval of the council, and uh, what we've done so far is involved uh, two council members in that process. So it was just a, it was just a question uh, with regard to, to moving forward. It, it would not it, meant to be not to be a bone of contention. Well, the, the ordinance the ordinance says that the council shall interview the applicant. So, as far as I'm concerned, you haven't complied with the ordinance anyway. But certainly, whatever you have left. Well, I mean, you I mean, have your well, opinion, that is certainly but that is yeah, that, that is how the ordinance reads. Well, the council yeah, will interview applicants, so it, it would appear I, as though you violated the ordinance. Well, it would appear not. not. So how, how do you set? How do you figure? We haven't done any other question. You interviewed them over the phone. You just said you did. So yeah, right, and that is not the council. Two people are not the council. <coughs> we have interviewed them in accordance with direction from the majority of the council. That's exactly what's occurred. Is there anything else? You did not ask for us. Is there anything to else? Present a committee to interview the. I would entertain a motion to. You can sign those. Applicants. Those Motion Harrison, second Broxman, that we adjourn. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? No. no. Motion <laughs> carries. Sorry.